Okay, we'll move on to now uh, Jackie Skinner Forster, Foster, uh, Executive Director of, uh, for Hope for Harvey. And uh, Jackie will talk to us about a family's journey to a cure. Jackie? Yes, thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. yes. So I am Jackie Skinner Foster. I'm president of the Hope for Harvey Foundation. And I just want to say thank you to Neonwe and to the team at IXLs. Um, for inviting us and including us in this event, for having this event to share awareness about the, the journey our families um, go through and the tough path to finding a treatment, um, and also just for the work that you're doing in the lab. We were fortunate to work with IXLs on Harvey's patient-derived IPSC line, and we are so grateful for all the work that they did for us um, and hope to collaborate with them again in the future. Um, so you can go ahead and go to the next slide, and I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about um, Harvey's journey and um, to a diagnosis, and then why we decided to form the Hope for Harvey Foundation and what our mission is with the Hope for Harvey Foundation. So this is Harvey. Um, he is my little boy, so I am the executive director, but I'm also mom to Harvey. And Harvey, of course, was born in March 2020, um, right at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we were living in Seattle, Washington, of all places, um, and he was born three days before the first um, lockdown. And so our journey was probably colored some by the COVID-19 pandemic and what was going on. But to be honest, I had a pretty uneventful pregnancy. Um, he was born on his due date with a planned C-section after I'd had an emergency with my older daughter. And in general, other than some mild jaundice, there were no significant concerns. Um, he was breastfeeding at birth, you know, shortly after. And they were like at 36 hours, just, hey, get out of the hospital. You know, you're healthy. You have a healthy little child. You don't want to be here and get sick. So that's what we did. And we took home what we thought was a healthy little boy. And we honestly felt so grateful given the circumstances of um, the world at that point in time. And we did what most people did at that point in time. It just kind of hunkered down for the next several months. And there wasn't anything glaringly concerning um, from birth, you know, things that wouldn't have been alarming. Yes, Harvey had some congenital strabismus, so some eye crossing, but that's not super uncommon. Um, he had that reflexor grab when he was a newborn. So nothing that we were super concerned about, but as development progressed, Harvey wasn't crawling, he wasn't rolling over. Um, we were still struggling with things like tummy time and head control and screaming. And my background, I'm an educational psychologist and I've worked with individuals with disabilities for the past um, 20 years or so. Haven't worked with the infant population, but based off of what I know about development and having an older child, I knew that these were not typical um, concerns. And so I reached out to our pediatrician when Harvey was eight months old. And we've had really fantastic providers. And I know a lot of um, diagnostic journeys, unfortunately, are kind of hindered by providers that maybe aren't listening to parents and don't see the concerns. And we were very fortunate that we did not experience that. Um, and without even seeing Harvey, our pediatrician immediately referred us to the Children's Hospital in Seattle. And when they spoke to me and learned about our presenting concerns, they deemed Harvey an emergency case. Um, at that time, they really did not want um, unhealthy individuals in the hospital, so they were only really seeing emergency cases. And at this point now, it's December 2020. Um, it's two days before Christmas. And we're sitting in a very empty hospital um, and seeing our first neurology um, appointment. And really, my concern and the neurologist's concern at that point in time was whether Harvey perhaps had some form of cerebral palsy. Um, he had some asymmetry going on, and I was worried that he had suffered some kind of perinatal stroke. Um, I've worked with um, individuals like that in the past, and so that was our first concern. And I had brought along my uh, microarray testing I had, had done while I was pregnant that showed no significant results. So we really did not think that the presenting concerns would lead us back to a genetic disorder at that point in time. 
Um, and I said, you know, here's a fun caveat. We are about to move across the country um, back to Austin, Texas in the next few weeks. Is there any way we can get this testing done and um, before we leave? And they're like, we can certainly do some of this diagnostic testing. So we went in early January 2021 um, and had the brain MRI and some initial blood work done. And there were no significant findings, really. He did have some very mild delayed myelination on his brain MRI, um, but nothing that anyone was super concerned about. And so, again, we felt like, you know what, maybe this is just a blimp. Like, we're just going to be super fortunate and we're going to look back on this. Um, really no idea what was ahead of us at that point in time. So... I said, you know, is there a way for us to go ahead and make a referral to neurology at the Children's Hospital in Austin? And they said, unfortunately, you can't make state to state referrals, which is another kind of system systemic problem that we have in our systems. Um, and so they're like, you're going to have to go and reestablish care with a pediatrician in Austin who would then make a referral to neurology and typically wait lists for neurology are about a year long. So that's what we had ahead of us as we were moving back to Austin. And I was very fortunate. Um, one of my girlfriends is actually a neuroscientist at the University of Texas here in Austin. Um, and she works closely with the medical school neurology department. And she reached out to the neurology department. Um, and when they heard our story and our concerns, um, one of the neurologists took a research day to come into the clinic and see Harvey. So we were very fortunate, and we've just always had a team of people who continue to step up for us. Um, and so we waited our two-week quarantine and went in, and he reviewed that brain MRI. And, um, you know, it's like, this is a beautiful brain. Everything's intact. I'm not concerned. Um, he's like, but let's order some more blood work and start and do another microarray. Um, so that was our first round of genetic testing, ultimately more insignificant results and led us to whole exome sequencing. Um, and we unfortunately did not get those results until Harvey was almost 18 months old. So we knew we had an appointment coming up in August of 2021 at this point, um, and I hadn't received the results still and had been quite a time. And I called the neurologist's office and they said, oh, we do have the results. I, she's going to share it with you at your next appointment. And I thought, well, if there was anything significant, they surely would have called me. Um, and then, of course, Harvey had a little cold. So we had to do our uh, visit um, virtually. And um, we have a wonderful neurologist. After that initial referral, um, they sent us on to see a neurologist who focuses in autism and does believe that there's a direct link between these ultra rare genetic disorders and autism. Um, and she shares with me on our virtual appointment that Harvey um, actually did come back with significant results on his whole exome sequencing. And he was diagnosed with GLG4 related synaptopathy. And um, DLG4-related synaptopathy is a monogenetic neurologically-based disorder. Um, it affects the coding of PSD95. It's a postsynaptic connection. And she was explaining this to me, that her understanding of the very limited literature on this disorder, um, as the, only, the first paper that had only been published truly on DLG4 had been in April of 2021. So Harvey's results came out, were finished in July, just a few months later, and we're honestly very fortunate that he wasn't a variant of unknown significance. Um, and so she didn't have very much information to go off of. At that point in time, there were about 45 cases in the world. Um, Harvey was now one of two with his specific single point missense mutation on the um, tail end of the DLG4 gene. But she noted that his symptoms did appear to match up with the profile of uh, this, um, most of them being de novo mutations, so random mutations. And um, she explained that he's not producing what she thought enough of this protein. And I said, well, there's got to be a drug or something we can give my son to make this protein. I mean, that just seems logical to me. And she said, you know, I'm really sorry, but there's nothing that I'm aware of that could help your son. And really had no resources for us, you know, didn't refer us to Nords or Global Genes. She did refer us to Simon Searchlight and referred us on to genetic counseling, which took another eight months to get into. 
Um, and so unfortunately, I think a lot of families in this situation, they're just not given a lot of resources because our local hospitals don't have a lot of resources. And we live in a somewhat major city and they, we still don't have those resources. Um, so I was like, but I just, you know, I hear, I've been hearing about CRISPR and these genetic eye disorders that are being treated. Like clearly there must be something out there. So I decided to do some of my own research. Um, and if you start Googling treatments for genetic disorders, you're not going to find much that's very helpful. You'll find some random papers and um, the literature is going to be um, not understandable to most people. I have a graduate degree and I, I can't understand most of it. Um, and so I started thinking about my personal network. And I remembered I had a girlfriend from college who had gone on to get her PhD in genetics at the University of Chicago. So I reached out to her and she told us to talk to in Lorem and Tim Yu. And so that's what I did. And now it's December of 2021. Um, and I know Tim is speaking and I just have to say that um, Tim Yu and his team, they're just so wonderful. Um, not only are they brilliant, but they are kind and caring and responsive. And um, not very many researchers will actually share um, their contact information online, let alone respond to parents. But Tim responded and he said, you know, unfortunately, I don't know anything about DLG4, um, but from what I can glean, I don't think an ASL approach is going to work. And I'm so sorry. Um, and I don't know if it was because Tim responded or um, if it was because I wasn't getting responses from the other hundreds of researchers that I was emailing and calling, but I just kind of kept pestering him. And the ULAB, they kept responding. Um, and they have been wonderfully consultative and helpful to us throughout this process. And I'm just so grateful to them. And I also started to reach out to other rare disease parents that I knew were in our community. Um, and I have a mom in my neighborhood who has a little boy with Angelman's and who's very involved and fast. And she has been an amazing resource as well. And she referred me to Casey McPherson and to Everloom Bio. Um, and also, excuse me, Combined Brain. And um, Casey McPherson is just an amazing rare disease dad and the work that he's doing. And I quickly started to learn about everything he was trying to do with Everloom Bio. And I started reaching out to the other foundations that were a part of Combined Brain, especially the synaptopathies. And I was asking, what are, what's out there? Uh, maybe a treatment that's gonna work for your kids or what path are you taking could work for my son and for our disorder. And these families and um, patient advocacy leaders, they are so overwhelmed and yet they continue to show up and make time for other um, parents like me and to answer our questions. And they've really truly been my best resource through this process. So, we get some information about a path that we could potentially take towards an ASO treatment for our son. Um, and, you know, I have been going kind of to the DLG4 community and expressing, let's all get together and really go after our treatment. And maybe we're a little bit more overzealous and wanted to move faster. And we really decided at a certain point that we should go ahead and form our own foundation. And so last May, we formed the Hope for Harvey Foundation. Um, and, you know, our little boy has made very little progress since he was that eight month little baby. Um, Harvey has a more extreme expression of a neurological disorder. Harvey has no form of communication. He really just screams at us in frustration. He can't point at pictures. AAC devices have not been helpful. He doesn't know how to sign, and we've signed with him since he was six, month old, six months. He has no independent mobility. He can be placed in a gait trainer and move around um, our home in that now, um, but he can't physically get into that gait trainer. He has no functional hand use. He can't self-feed, can't pick up the food in front of him. He can't pick up objects, and he's most likely severely cognitively impaired. Um, and has significant GI and sleep issues. And we just started to realize that if we didn't do something, 
nothing was going to be done in a time frame that mattered for Harvey or for children like him. Um, given that we had a very newly identified disorder being identified only in April of 2021, um, we needed to do something. And so our mission at Hope for Harvey has been to focus purely on translational medicine. Um, and so we are working on creating our assets, IPSC lines, um, and IXLs was um, wonderful in helping us create that patient drive line. Um, and then we will drive neurons out of that and focus on ASOs, um, a repurposed drug screen, and potentially an AAV project with an Israeli researcher that I met at a conference recently who's interested in working on DLG4. Um, but we are seeing very kind of narrow focused on what are the steps to creating a treatment for our um, loved ones because there's only so much time. And um, I knew that if I did nothing, I would regret it. And if, even if I did something and I failed, I could live with myself. But I see the successes of so many of the other um, foundations who have come before us and what they're achieving. And I truly do have hope that with labs like IXLs, like Everloom Bio, who are making these um, steps achievable in terms of cost and timelines, that we can truly do this and we can find treatments for our loved ones. And we will start with Harvey and DLG4. And I hope long term as a foundation, we are able to help other rare genetic disorders find a path to treatment. So thank you so much um, for hearing our story, for sharing these stories. Um, and we just look forward to the year to come and to hearing the outcomes of um, everyone's um, journey towards a treatment. So thank you.